Welcome to the Michael Brooks Show. This is a special bonus video and podcast for everybody. It's unlocked. It's free content for patrons and the whole broader TMBS universe. Joining me for this journey is Kaniella Ng. He is a state legislator in Hawaii, and he's running a campaign for the Democratic primary to represent Hawaii's first district in the United States Congress, United States House of Representatives. He's affiliated with bold progressives. He's a justice Democrat candidate. Most importantly for this show, he's a member of Democratic Socialists of America and running a really unapologetic and clear campaign on rights, justice, dealing with inequality and taking care of the environment. Uh, thank you, Kaniella, for being with us. Thanks so much for having me. Glad to be with you. Can you tell us your story briefly? What's your map to being where you are? How did you get started in activism and politics? Sure. Um, yeah, I'm a, kind of an unlikely politician. I don't come from money or power like a lot of other young folks involved. Um, you know, they tend to be dynastic. Yep. But for me, my mom worked at a Macy's as a shoe clerk. My dad was a hotel he was a, a rate waiter at a hotel um and he was an lw member but then he passed away when i was 11 so my mom had to take care of us four kids and our grandma on our own she'd often skip meals to feed us and uh i had to work in the pineapple fields at 14 years old so it's a, it's a hawaii thing uh, but yeah. uh you know I, we relied on a lot of government programs like free school lunch and social security supplemental income and medicaid and uh, we came out to the side of some hard times, but I know that so many folks aren't as lucky. A lot of the undocumented folks that I was working shoulder to shoulder with in the field, um, they're still out there, you know. Uh, so uh, that's what we do it. Uh, in Hawaii, it's all about having aloha for one another, but the elites like to use that to just tell us to calm down and not fight for what we deserve. They kind of turn that against us in the name of civility. Um, so the theme of our campaign is we fight for Aloha. It's kind of paradoxical in a sense, but, um, you know, this, this system lacks Aloha. Uh, and it's, it's rigged against us. Like, our generation is not set up to succeed. So, um, yeah, I mean, that's the background. I, so I just fight for working families because I come from one. And getting into politics was, um, you know, that was more of a gradual process. As a Native Hawaiian, you don't come into politics. Politics finds you because it threatens your existence. Yeah. yeah, yeah. <laughs> Be it, uh, you know, from economics or, or like we're in economic and environmental exile today. But there's more Hawaiians living outside of Hawaii than, than here. So it, it finds a way of finding you. And, um, you know, I, I'm a musician, listen to a lot of Bob Marley growing up and yeah. his songs. We're um, big, we are reggae uh, partisans on this show. So. That's, oh that's, yeah, I that's mean, very, like, do you, have you been listening to Chronics? Like Ambush in to... the night. I mean, they they they're all about like workers workers' rights and like organizing right. bottom up movements. Um, probably, I mean, probably they're they are, I guess, left wing, but it's just not even. I don't even think you know Bob was thinking about it that way. It was just like straight from the bottom up um, uprising. And uh, actually, I think it's one of the names of one of his albums. <laughs> so, I mean, that's kind of what politicized me. Like a lot of folks talk about uh, various rock bands and, and things or punk bands. But it was um, here in Hawaii, it was, it was a lot of exposure to, to the arts. What did uh, when you and were then, elected to then, the... Yeah, you were elected oh, to the sorry. state. And then, and then, yeah, go ahead. Yeah, yeah. I, I got into like student politics and... Um, in college, it was uh, it was kind of weird because I wasn't involved in any other politics before that. It was just sports and music and things for me. Um, and but then we had a Republican governor in Hawaii for the first time, and she uh, cut our university by like 130 million dollars. So I decided to run for student president, and uh, we did a grassroots. Like my opponent had his he was like a frat boy who's uh, uh, dad gave him like four thousand dollars to run this student campaign. <laughs> And he had the entire frat helping him, uh, but we won by like forty votes, uh, and just doing the grassroots. And um, yeah, that's where we like finalized our, our my first socialist policy. It was uh, the bus passes were four hundred dollars, 
and uh, at the time, but only poor kids needed it. So we made it. So it was $10. Everyone shipping $10 and everybody get a bus pass. Awesome. And it was wildly popular. And, uh, you know, from then on, just kept trying to fight fiercely for working people. And then you became elected to the state legislature. And I just maybe just touch on three things and then we'll get to your campaign now. But there's three other things I wanted to hit on for people. One was elected to the state legislature when you were 22 years old. When did you and what made you join the Democratic Socialists of America and and identify specifically in that way? And then also maybe your run in with uh, Mark Zuckerberg's vulture plans for Hawaii. <laughs> yeah, um, yeah, I was elected at 23. I saw a Tea Party guy that got elected on my home island. It was a Republican district, uh, one of the few. And he was like selling out our island. He didn't have the values. He wanted to cut all the programs I relied on growing up. So I took a shot. I was working at Four Seasons from 4 a.m. to noon, a uh, full time shift. And I just knocked on doors until sunrise and I mean, sunset. And then I'll do everything at night. Um, for correspondence and we won by 26 percent and i personally knocked in over fifteen thousand doors so uh, that was you know because i wasn't i was unmoored from corporate donors uh, i had a lot of freedom in the legislature i was able to speak truth to people like zuckerberg or uh, you know anybody who tries to mess with us um and you know he in regards to democratic socialism it just feels like i mean i've been a democrat since 2012 but like Democrats don't speak English often. Like they don't talk like all people talk. I don't know what, like where their focus is. Um, it's like, yeah, Republicans, Donald Trump, they're bad. They're pulling our nation backwards, but at least they know where the hell they're going. So like Democrats, they lack that vision. Like they don't know what their goal is. Uh, so for me, what appealing, what's appealing to democratic socialism is we just, we, we talk about human need. Like why is it in the richest country in the history of the world like folks there's so many people are homeless and uninsured and not having their basic human rights met like there's no excuse and as long as we can like focus on like the media and the urgency of these problems we face and showing folks that a better world is possible we will win like we've ignored um like all these people that are in these red states and went to trump those those people were rooted in the workers movement and we just ignored them for years and years and they've only been hearing one side um, and, you know, if you pull our issues that Democratic Socialists care about, like Medicare for all or housing for all or, um, you know, a Green New Deal or a student debt cancellation, like these are these are um, like we're pushing the envelope. Like people aren't really talking about these, a federal job guarantee, but they're still wildly popular. So I don't understand why Democrats aren't talking about it more. So we're trying to, to kind of restore the heart and soul to that workers movement. Um, and, yeah, Zuckerberg, he. He tried to sue a bunch of native Hawaiians. He bought 700 acres on one of the most beautiful places in our state, where they filmed Jurassic Park and all these like Avatar and stuff. And uh, you know, I called him a modern day colonizer and fought him in the press. And um, ultimately, he dropped the lawsuits. But it's it's sort of a on. He was trying to get people off now. their land so he could just have like a massive sort of vacation estate, yeah. essentially. Um, well, it's like a it's yeah. like a post-apocalyptic bunker or something. I don't, right. know, I don't know why someone would need 700 acres. It's it's absurd. Well, because you're you're planning on a societal collapse and you have no interest in any type of mutual aid or your fellow humanity, right? Like, that's why. Um, can you run through, I mean, you've already touched on them, uh, but I know, uh, obviously, you're running uh, – Medicare for all, every single person in this country, man, woman, and child, needs full and complete health care coverage, obviously. Uh, but you also mentioned the federal job guarantee and also something I think which is really significant uh, and needs to also be significantly put on the table. I mean, of course, student loan uh, cancellation, a debt jubilee on student loans, uh, but also you have a plan for universal housing. Can you talk about that a little bit? Sure, it's the number one issue facing our state right now. For Hawaii, it's eight hundred thousand dollars of the median house now, uh, which means you got to be making two hundred k a year yep. uh, to afford the average house, and so it's out of reach for most folks. Um, you know, we look at they say it's like a population problem, but I look at Singapore; it's half the size of Oahu, our main island, 
and it's uh, it has 5.6 million people, six times as much as here. And each person pays on average 23 percent of their income, and they get a three bedroom, a brand new three bedroom property. Um, and I'm paying like 40 percent of my income just to rent a one bedroom apartment that was built 50 years ago. Right. So our system is broken, and it's not a matter of scarcity. Like scarcity is a political choice. Like I'm I'm looking out my window right now, and I'm seeing these like luxury luxury condos, these high rises, glass high rises and popping up every month here and some going for twenty million dollars a unit next to homeless native Hawaiians and veterans on the street. Like the money is there. It's just being sucked out by out of state um speculative investors. And we're building for profit rather than um human need. So we need to stand up to luxury developers. Our plan is ten million houses in the next social houses in the next um uh, 10 years, uh, providing loans and 0% down payments for people everywhere and social housing to areas of need and uh, enacting modern rent stabilization or rent control and a tenant bills of rights. So, uh, you know, landlords can't take advantage of of the renting class like they are now. And, uh, you know, people say like, oh, well, renters and these working people, they don't vote. So, like, these policies are really going to not play well with your typical voter who owns a house and I'm like they don't vote because you're not talking to their issues right right so um we're right. just trying to think about that uh, it's all about turnout right with, with these sorts of proposals and um speaking just speaking to the needs of, of folks here and, and frankly it's no longer like a divide between the working class and middle class like it's all of us even the folks that were considered rich just 10 years ago in Hawaii versus the ultra, ultra international wealthy now. Right. And it's just sucking up um, all of our resources here. Yeah, that that's a definitely a, a national and global story, and particularly a place like New York City where I live. And I could tell you, you know, just anecdotally, growing up as I did with a family that faced evictions um, and dealt with those kind of situations, the type of anxiety... Uh, I mean, I, I it seems like it should be obvious, but it's amazing how little that is in the public discourse, the type of just basically what that, I mean, really just the violence that families that face housing insecurity uh, deal with and children go through um, that affect, all, of course, all these other indicators, healthcare, education, and all the other important things we talk about. There's two other things I want to touch on uh, before you go. One, maybe also obviously abolish ICE, uh, the you know, Republican administration and Republican Congress, essentially, you know, policy of kidnapping children at the border uh, and this sort of broader kind of effort to really uh, engineer an electorate that will work in the long term for Republicans and play to very core kind of white identity politics. You know, some Democrats are catching up specifically with the kind of abolish ICE slogan but I'm curious if in addition to abolishing ICE, you have some kind of broader ideas about bringing the same kind of humanity and values uh, to the immigration system. Yeah, um, I think you you got it there. Uh, I mean, we didn't need ICE before 2002. Like it's a new agency um, and we don't need it now. It was really formed by George W. Bush as another scapegoating tactic to justify his Iraq war. Um, and the fact that we, like Obama and our Democrats just went along with it is um, unfortunate and immoral. Uh, it's not just at the border, right? Even in Hawaii, we have, uh, because, because we live on islands and uh, you can't just throw people in vans and they disappear and you take them to the facility and detainment, you got to actually take them on the air on, you know, between islands to the airport. So I catch a late flight from Maui to Oahu and I always see these, like I regularly, like once a week, see these guys getting thrown, um, getting tossed around by these, uh, by these assholic ice agents. Uh, and it's just, I, 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 and they're like the grown men in tears, right? Because they just got pulled from their families. And these guys wait right. until like Christmas Eve and to, when they do their big raids, because that's when the most family members are in one place. Jesus. And it's just like this Gestapo like yes. um, agency has no place in America. Um, and we can get rid of it by defunding it. But also, we need to um, 
you know, look at the, the, all the laws that, that affect it and, um, that, that cause they are ultimately just an enforcement agency as well. Final question. Um, in terms of how this is uh, turning out into the world, um, what a democratic socialist foreign policy looks like, uh, you know, across the board in terms of, uh, you know, I, I'll try to simplify it, but I mean, obviously I think on a number of issues, I think people are definitely much more concerned about certainly a policy in Israel, Palestine, which is, uh, you know, I mean, at the very least, more humane and in accordance with international norms and opposed to, uh, you know, systemic occupation and racial discrimination. Uh, I'm and on this show, we cover what's happening even now in Latin America uh, quite a bit. And you look at a place like uh, Brazil, where former President Lula da Silva has uh, been imprisoned by a very right wing government and judiciary on, you know, very questionable charges and what sort of looks like essentially at least in my view, you know, a strategy to keep the most popular politician in the country from running again uh, so the government can uh, turn back the progress that was made under his administration and, and implement austerity. And the United States seems to have some anger that uh, the Workers' Party, his party, refused to, to privatize Petrobras, the Brazilian uh, national oil company. That's very broad, but I mean, I, is there anything kind of principle when you think about the world, um, and then also obviously being in Hawaii, thinking about relations with the Pacific countries and so on, like is it uh, cutting military spending? Is it reorienting you know, foreign policy towards diplomacy? I mean, what, is it thinking of uh, you know, international agreements that center on labor and ecology instead of just writing the rules in favor of corporations? I just want to get a little bit of a sense of what that looks like to you from an outward-facing perspective. Um, well, yes, to, to all the above. Um, but one thing that, I mean, liking it back to to ICE and, like, my indigenous roots as a native client, like, we know what it feels like to be displaced from our homeland. Yeah. Um, and... We know that whether it's a war on drugs or a war on terror or war for whatever the hell reason the White House makes up, it's, they're really wars for profit. Yep. And they're wars that are causing indigenous people all over the world to be displaced just like we were. Um, and it's our duty to let them in. So that's, you know, finding those connections and understanding that if you look at American unions, they start with the word international for a reason. Right. Because our first organizers knew that um, solidarity extended beyond our borders. And, you know, the only way we're really going to um, have our true uprising is by doing it together. So that's one thing I think that we got to re- keep focused on because, you know, there's a lot of America first rhetoric going on. But um, meanwhile, like they're making us scrap over crumbs on the ground, but they're sitting, the fat cats are up there eating the whole pie. So we got to make sure that we're not scapegoating each other and really point um, point at the real enemy, which is these like corporate oligarchs. And, that's exactly um, right. You know, these, these big donors. So um, anti-interventionalism is good, I think, it is, is okay. But uh, anti-imperialism is better. And frankly, right. I've never seen American politicians talk about that. Um, so we're trying to start it now in this that's, campaign. That's perfect. Uh, let's get you elected to Congress, uh, Kaniela Ng. Tell all of the people again, what is uh, primary day? And we'll have links, obviously, to all the ways that people can reach out to your campaign. And there's a lot of different venues they could do it through. As I say, justice, there's a whole contingent of uh, justice Democrats who are obviously really effective in Queens with Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez, uh, the Democratic Socialists of America, Democratic Socialists of Hawaii. Um, tell us the ways people can reach out to you and the TMBS community can support your campaign. Sure. Uh, the best way is kaniellaing.com. Um, there's all sorts of events. And of course, uh, we don't take any corporate money or money from lobbyists. So uh, we broke the record of the most individual donors in, in this district by, by like, I think three or four X now. We are, we're over 7,000, uh, averaging around $30. And uh, it's really encouraging to see. And I know it's like the people who give, they're not rich people, so it, it really means a lot. Um, but that's what it's about, right? Just just working people um, coming together. And uh, it's I see myself as more of a movement candidate. So 
um, you know, this race isn't about like who's best qualified. It's just like our values and our policies and fighting for a world that is not just better for our children and grandchildren, but also also for ourselves. Like, why do they always want to walk in right off our generation, uh, right off our generation? Like we're we're still, we still have a shot, y'all. Um, and you know, if we don't move now, like climate change will, um, like sea level rise will drown Waikiki. We'll see a three foot sea level rise within my son's generation, um, unless we act in the next 15 years, but that's going to take signing up the corporation. So, um, any folks who, who believe in our message can contribute, um, they can join. We have remote events, uh, phone banking, text banking, all sorts of things. It's, it's just all at ConnieLaAng.com. Connie Ella Ng, I really appreciate your time. Thanks so much for joining us. And uh, I really like the idea of, I mean, my understanding of Aloha, I don't know it very well. I've never been to Hawaii, unfortunately, but it's some type of like kind of deep recognition and respect for kind of fellow humans, fellow beings in general. And I love that you said that it's not a kind of cheap, fake civility. It's actually a really deep commitment. And it's something that we need to fight for and reclaim in our time. And you're doing a lot for that and everybody involved with you. So I really appreciate your time. Thank you, Michael. All right, man. I'll let you know when this goes out, okay? All right. Thanks so much for taking all this time. Oh, it's my pleasure. Thanks so much. Good luck. All right. Aloha. Aloha. Yeah, shorten it. Uh, but he's pretty good. Oh, yeah. He's got, they're, they're starting to find the people who are like, even like, honestly, even like, because uh, Allison Hartson's out there working for him. Uh, and like, well, she's done doing this stuff well, no, she's still like a justice democratic, whatever. She just is, she actually was in Queens for Alexandria too. But I just, but even with her, it's like the truth of the matter was like, they should have just started her at a smaller district. Like, they, they are picking some good people, is my point.